In the previous video, we introduced the travel cost method and talked about the first problem with it, which is time costs. So I now want to talk about pro problem number two, which is one trip to more than one destination. So going back to the example that we used last time, suppose that you are interviewing, surveying someone who is visiting Yellowstone National Park, and you ask them how much it costs them to visit the park, and they tell you. But Yellowstone National Park is right next to another uh, national park called Grand Teton Yellow, uh, National Park. Let me just write down Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks. And and um, Maybe the only reason they're visiting Yellowstone is because it happens to be right next to Grand Teton National Park, and Grand Teton National Park is what they were really interested in visiting. In other words, they incurred most of the travel costs in order to go to Grand Teton National Park. But since they were at Grand Teton National Park, and since Yellowstone is right next to Grand Teton, they decided, well, now the extra travel cost just to go from Grand Teton, where I am right now, to Yellowstone is very low. So I'll just go and look at Yellowstone. And during that trip, you happen to survey them. So, so they made one trip to more than one destination, to two destinations. One was Yellowstone and one was Grand Teton. Now, how do you divide up the travel costs? Let's say it's a tourist from Japan, like we were talking about last time. So how do you divide up the travel costs between what they incurred to go to Yellowstone and what they incurred to go to Grand Teton? Needless to say, it's difficult, maybe impossible. It would probably be hard I mean, for the tourists themselves to say, what percentage of the travel costs they incurred because they wanted to go to one park versus the other. I mean, it's true if they don't like Yellowstone and they like Grand Teton, then it's kind of obvious that all the travel costs was incurred to go to Grand Teton. But otherwise, it's probably not obvious even to the tourist. So this problem number two, one trip to more than one destination, is a problem for the travel cost method. You don't know. If you're interested in just the value for one park, for Yellowstone, you don't know how to take the information of the total cost to visit two parks and divide it into just the part that that concerns the Yellowstone. Okay, so that's problem number two. Problem number three is called substitute sites. So the book discusses it on page 117, and I'm going to draw a graph. Suppose you have two people, A and B, and this is the map. A represents where person A lives, and B represents where person B lives. And these little asterisks denote parks. So A, A's house is pretty close to a lot of parks, and B's house is not. Let's say you're interested in determining what value A and B have for this particular park. I'm going to rewrite B in a slightly different way. You'll see why in a minute. Because I want to write B so that, in fact, I'm going to get my straight edge, so that the distance from A to the park is the same as the distance from B, from B's house to the park. So let's suppose that this distance and this distance are the same. I didn't draw them quite right. Let me, maybe I can do, do a little bit better. But you get the point. And let's suppose that since the distance is the same, the travel cost is the same. So you survey, you're at this the park, the one that's circled, and you survey A, and then you survey B, and they have identical travel costs. Now, if you're just using the travel cost method, you would conclude that A and B like the park equally. 
but do they really? So A has a lot of what we call substitute sites. A could go to any one of these other parks that are close to A's house. B doesn't have any substitute sites. So, so A had a lot of choice and decided to go to this park. Let me call this park, let me give the park a name. Let me call the park Y. Maybe Y for Yellowstone. So A decides to go to park Y, but he could have gone to a whole lot of other parks which have similar travel costs. Why did he go to Y? Well, he must like Y better than he likes those other parks. How about B? Maybe B actually doesn't really like Y very much, but what choice does he have? I mean, I'm sure there are parks much farther away from B's house that he might like better than Y, but in terms of having relatively small travel costs, Y is the only thing he has. He has no substitutes. So, you know, here we talked about substitute sites. A has substitute sites and B doesn't. So the conclusion is you can't trust the travel cost methods, the travel cost methods conclusion, which is that since the travel cost for A to park Y is the same as the travel cost for B to park Y, then A and B value the park equally. Instead, it's likely that A values the park more than B does. Now, let's be a little bit careful. So what I've written is for A, value minus travel cost. So the value is the subjective, that's what we're talking about, valuation, minus the travel cost, is positive. That's why he decided to go. And it's larger than any other sites, because if it were smaller than one of the other sites, then he would have gone to that other site. Because here, this, this criterion, value minus travel cost, is a criterion that basically shows the net gain that a consumer gets to visiting a site. His own subjective personal value minus his travel cost. So he'll go to the site that gives him the biggest value minus travel cost. If he went to Y, that means that Y had the biggest value minus travel cost, which means that for, for a person A, Y's value minus travel cost was not only positive, but it was larger than any other sites. Now, the same is true for B, but B doesn't have any other sites. So all you know for B is that value minus travel cost is positive. Okay, so for B, you know that, I guess I'll write this in. So we know that B's value minus, let me call travel cost TC, is positive. And we know that A's value minus TC is positive, but we also know that A's value minus TC is greater than the other site's value minus TC. Now, so what can we say? We're we're supposing here, just for the sake of this particular argument, that B's travel cost and A's travel cost are the same. In fact, if we want to make it really simple, perhaps less realistic, we could even assume that the other site's travel costs are the same. So that, and I, that's really the way I drew it. I, I drew the other sites in a in a in a circle around A. So. You can think of the distance from these other sites to A as being the same as the distance from Y to A, and so maybe they're, all the travel costs are the same. So, so, so we have this, um, and we have this, and we have this. 
Now, maybe... So I was trying to argue that it's likely that that A values the park more. But to really know for sure... Well, you can't really know for sure. Um, part of it depends on on the other site's uh, value minus travel cost. For instance, if all of them were negative, if A really didn't like any of these other sites, then, uh, then this says that A's value minus TC is positive, and this would say A's value minus TC is greater than a whole bunch of negative numbers, which is the other site's value minus TC. Well, if we already knew that it was positive, we or then it's clear that it's it doesn't tell us any new information that it's bigger than a whole bunch of negative numbers. So that that wouldn't help. We would just we would just have this equation and this equation and couldn't really say anything. A more interesting would be if some of these numbers are positive. Cause then we know not only that let me do some erasing. Then we would know not only that this is true, but we'd know that the left hand side was bigger than some positive number. Like uh, pick a number, fifteen. Whereas for B, we only know that B's value minus TC is greater than zero. Now again, this is not completely convincing. In other words, to say that A's value minus TC is greater than 15, and to say that B's value minus TC is greater than 0 does not imply that B's value is bigger than A's value. I mean, that A's value is bigger than B's value. Um, I mean, th this left hand side, you know, it could be 70. <laughs> so. Um, so as I said here, this doesn't really prove anything, but at least it raises the question that maybe even though A and B have exactly the same travel cost to park Y, they don't have the same value for park Y, and that A has a higher value than B. So even though we can't prove it, at least it's something that if you're using the travel cost method, you don't want to be concerned about. So I, I think that's as far as we can go here. All right, next problem, problem number four, house purchase decision. So suppose you're surveying somebody in Yellowstone National Park, a visitor, and you ask what travel costs did they incur to visit the park. And the person says, oh, I just live right outside the park in the village of West Yellowstone. So it didn't cost me very much at all just to, just to come to the park. My house is just a couple of miles away from the, the park boundary. But then he tells you that uh, he used to live in Texas. And he used to visit Yellowstone a lot. And in fact, he fell in love with Yellowstone and decided to move from Texas to West Yellowstone just because he loved Yellowstone so, mar so much. Now, the travel cost method says a lower bound on his value is his travel cost. His travel cost was very little, so the lower bound on his value is very little. But the reason that his travel cost is little is because he decided to buy a house, his house purchase decision, he decided to buy a house next to Yellowstone National Park. So actually his value of the, of the park is really high. So the pro so problem number four is that if you just collect information on travel costs, which is what this method is about, you may underestimate the value that is put on the park by people because some people decided to decrease their travel cost by moving closer to the park because they like the park so much. Problem number four is related to problem number five, which is non-paying or local visitors. To make a distinction, suppose you have somebody who was born and raised in West Yellowstone. 
So they've always lived in West Yellowstone. Use the travel cost method to try to determine what their value for Yellowstone is. They have a very low travel cost. Does that mean they don't value the park much? Now, I, I said before, the travel cost I think I'll write it down. The travel cost method only gives you a lower bound. The, the, the travel cost method, TCM, says that the, the person's value is greater than or equal to their travel cost. Because if the person's value were less than their travel cost, they wouldn't have made the trip. Um, so it doesn't tell you what the person's value is. It only tells you this inequality. That's why I said it's a lower bound on the value is their travel cost. But the thing is that with problem number four and problem number five, their lower bound is pretty close to zero. And it's not giving you a good idea of what the person's value really is. All right, so that's the travel cost method. I'll, I'll stop this video here. In the next video, we'll do hedonic pricing.